Good to see you. Welcome back. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Joel, and we have teaching um, from the Bible here at Emmanuel Sunday by Sunday. We finished a series uh, of messages last week, as Stephen was saying. So we're starting, starting something new today, which will take us through the, uh, the summer holiday period. And um, it's a little different because what we want to do in these, in these Sundays is... Um, Rather than uh, looking at directly at the lives of uh, people in the scriptures, um, we will certainly be teaching from the Bible, but using examples of some, uh, some lives of men and women through the story of the church since then. Uh, so more recent people uh, whose lives are helpful as examples to us. Um, and so I'm going to start us off in a moment by uh, talking today from the life of uh, someone called James Hudson Taylor. Some of you won't be surprised to hear me say that. Some of you know that uh, uh, my, my wife and I named our first child after him, so he's certainly a bit of a hero in our eyes. We've even got a room in this building named after him, um, which some people are watching this message on right now with their babies. Um, and so he's certainly a hero of this church for reasons that might become clearer as we get into this message. Um, but to help us start this off, um, I want to t just refer to a verse in the New Testament book of Hebrews. It may be worth having that book open in front of you just for this particular verse. So Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, um, which uh, I think sets this up really helpfully in terms of how this series is meant to work, what this series of messages is meant to do. So I'll read to you uh, from Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7 in a moment. I, I keep I keep seeing them in my eye, and I can't help wanting to do this. So just before, just totally irrelevant, in brackets, parenthesis to this whole message, it's so nice to have Sam and Becky Cox with us here today. So, sorry. You know when you can't quite, you can't move on because you're being so distracted. You know, I just, I can't believe they're here. So I couldn't stop, I had to stop talking and you got that out of the way. So, uh, the nuisance that they are. They're... Um, <laughs> It's so good to have you guys. Welcome back. These are heroes of ours who've been uh, away and are still living in the States, in Washington, um, but are visiting the UK for, for some of the summer weeks. Uh, it's nice to have chosen a summer where we've actually got a summer. Well done. Um, okay, but hopefully you'll get a chance to say hi to them bef before you go home today. Um, Hudson Taylor... Uh, well, the Daily Telegraph a few years ago ran a story saying that by the year 2030, China may well be the most Christianized nation in the world, which would be quite remarkable uh, and ironic given that for the last sort of 70 years, Christianity has been uh, kind of at least unofficially suppressed. And, and at times, uh, ruthlessly, brutally persecuted to the point where there would be thousands who've been uh, martyred for the Christian faith and imprisoned and harassed in all kinds of ways. And yet, Christianity has flourished phenomenally. Tens of millions, perhaps hundreds, perhaps 150 million. Who, who can really know? Um, and yet those who make these kind of predictions say, yeah, within, within a few years, it may be the most Christian nation on the planet. Now, if you speak to Chinese Christian leaders, they, they might say that at least one of the main reasons for that is the life of the man that we're about to describe today, or at least learn from today, James Hudson Taylor. So in terms of achievements, we're talking about an extraordinary person. You may be here today... Uh, investigating Christianity, not sure about Christianity, uh, not sure even if you approve of Christianity, but I would have thought that we would all approve of the, the lives of people who have achieved something, achieved something extraordinary, perhaps people who've suffered and achieved something through their suffering. And th under those criteria, James Hudson Taylor certainly um, qualifies. He was a remarkable person, someone from whom we can all learn. Let me read to you from um, Hebrews 13, verse 7, then I'll just pray and then we'll get into what we have to say today. It says this, Remember your leaders, 
those who spoke to you the word of God, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus for your help that these words, uh, these stories, these lessons that we can learn from this person at a time and context quite different than us, these lessons would not simply uh, fill our heads with information, but would affect us, would confront us, would challenge us, perhaps comfort us, maybe even trouble us and cause us to rethink our lives uh, so that we might be more uh, trusting and confident in your trustworthiness and as a result more fruitful for your cause. We pray we would each one of us see something more of our Lord Jesus in this time we have. In his name we ask. Amen. Amen. So this is a helpful verse, I find, uh, when it comes to learning from the lives of men and women who've gone before us in the service of God. it's, It's helpful for lots of reasons, but let me just give you some key lessons to draw from it. It's, it's, it's instructing us to take wisdom, to remember things from the lives of those who have gone before us. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Then it says, consider the outcome of their way of life. Now listen, we, we generally, especially at this point, 21st century Brightonians and sort of Western people, we often like to kind of give the impression that we don't imitate. We're originals. We're not interested in conformity. We're not interested in learning from other people's example. We are, we are our own, thank you very much. You know, even this week I was uh, noticing the lyrics to an extremely popular uh, Hollywood musical that uh, if you've got kids around the age of my kids you have definitely been exposed to that's come out with the, the phrase from one of the songs this is me, I make no apology and uh, it's, it's, if you read the lyrics of the song it's, it's kind of preaching, to be honest a fairly strong gospel, a strong message of um, uh, personal independence almost in a defiant way I'm not going to fit with your expectations and your moulds and uh, your, your agenda because I am my own and I have my own uh, star to, to kind of pursue, my own path, my own story, my own destiny. It's, it's, it's about me. It's not about someone else. It's not about fitting in. And if you know the story that that, that film is, that musical is telling, you probably would kind of understand where it's coming from. But it kind of fits in. It's, it's with the grain of our culture. We, we don't imitate anyone. We, we are our own. We are all originals. I'm an original. And the Bible, and I think common sense, would beg to differ. Because the sheer reality is we can't actually help imitating. We just do. Even when we say we are not imitating, we are imitating. When we say, well, I won't conform, we're conforming. We're conforming with a certain narrative, a certain way of trying to do life which is non-conformist. The reality is we can't avoid it, but we can choose, it would seem, who we imitate. That's the point. It's not a question of whether you're going to imitate. You are, by virtue of human, gonna, being human, going to imitate someone, somewhere, in some way. The question is who? Whose life will you Uh, seek to imitate? Whose lives, plural, will you seek to imitate? And uh, this is what this verse is saying. Imitate by watching the way of life of those who've who've gone before you, serving Jesus Christ. And it speaks about the outcome of their lives. Have you considered the outcome of the lives most influencing your life? The people whose lives most influence yours, whether right up front, or whether more subtly, in ways you, you'd have to be a bit more awkwardly honest to accept and admit that you're, yeah, I'm a little bit like that person, or I, I do tend to follow the example of this person. Have you looked at the outcome of their lives? The Bible says, look at the outcome before you imitate someone's life. And it also says, look at the way of life. Look at the way of their life. 
It's interesting that a book comes to us saying, don't just learn from a book. Learn from the lives of people that have gone before you. Watch, watch their life. God has given you a, a book, but he's also given you kind of a library of lives that, that will help you, that will teach and train you, uh, inspire you, and give example, and, and, and give, give a guide to the decisions that you need to make, the, the paths you need to take. And what it specifically lands on in the end of the verse, specifically in terms of the particular area of imitation that we need to sort of go for, it says imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. And it's worth us pausing on that, especially at the outset of a series we're about to go through over the next six weeks where different examples of different men and women will come to you from this platform if you're here at Emmanuel for the next few Sundays. People whose lives are very varied. People whose stories are, are, are kind of mixed up. Some of whom would have, would have literally got on a boat and spent the rest of their life in a different country than the one they grew up in. Some of whom would have suffered in particular ways. Some of whom died at certain stages of life. That might surprise you, you know, early deaths and so on. You could think of multiple ways in which these stories would differ remarkably. And what we need to do is what the scripture says here, imitate their faith. Because if you try to imitate all the practical examples of their life, you'll get confused, you won't, it, it will be impossible anyway. There are definitely very individual things about you. In that sense, you can sing, you know, this is me, I make no apology. The, being yourself is a good principle because God made you yourself. God wired you quite differently. And yet, you need to learn as an individual to imitate the faith of those who've gone before you. And so in many ways, your, your life, if it's, if it's faithful to Christ, will take on the trappings and patterns, rhythms, uh, ways of people who've gone before you. Even if in the outward, less important respects, it looks extremely different. And so although I'm going to talk about a guy who went to China, the purpose of this message is not to send you all to China, I'm afraid. Yeah, some of you might be disappointed to hear. Uh, but, but that's not the main goal. The main goal is so that we learn to imitate the faith of this man. And really, if he was here, that would be his goal as well, I think. He would want you to see, to see how faithful the Savior is and how you can trust him and live a life out of confidence in the faithfulness of Jesus, which is a way better lesson by far. So it does mean that we're not going to do what's called hagiography over these next few weeks, by which I mean, you know, the, the lives of the saints that's done in a, in a way that, um, I've just noticed this clock isn't on, which is always a very bad thing for everyone. Just needs this clock to be on, otherwise we are here till next summer, okay? Just so you know. So I could talk about this guy literally that long, okay? So put the clock on. Um, so, so I can't remember where I was. Hagiography is where, where you, you tell the life of someone in a way that makes them kind of superhuman and so different than you that it's as though they're the kind of person that doesn't need a saviour. They didn't need Jesus. You do, but they didn't. They're really good. Well, you might, you might be as good as them. You could, if you try really hard to be as good as Hudson Taylor, maybe you too won't need a saviour. Again, that wouldn't be the point of this life at all. That's not, that's not helpful. The Bible doesn't tell stories like that. You know, the Bible doesn't tell it like... Do you remember the program 24 about 10 years ago where you get the, the hero, uh, Kiefer Sutherland, I can't remember his name, Jack Bauer, who, who, whose life you would follow in intricate detail for 24 hours of his life over a series, but he never once went to the loo. Not once in all the 24 hours that you saw, every episode, there was never a point where he was about to chase a terrorist and thought... I better just quickly go to the gents first. It'll take me a minute, but it will be better for everybody if I do. No, no, he just kind of had this superhuman capacity to go through life without that need. And Christian biographies can be a little similar. You know, this guy, he never had a problem. He never failed. Never, this woman, she, she never sinned really. She might have done some little sins, but never any of the sins that I do. Never had a bad day like I do. Not true. The Bible's quick to teach us this. Wants us to know that all the heroes except for one, <laughs> had feet of clay. And so you get, the, explicitly it's said in James, 
in the New Testament. Elijah, of all people, Elijah, who's closest to being superhuman of all the Bible characters, the most likely to be a Marvel character is Elijah. And he's, he is described as a man just like us. Just like us. Just like us. You need to know that. Okay? So this life is of someone just like you, and as will be the others. We mustn't sort of enshrine them in stained glass and then not be able to relate their stories to ours. Having said that, there are some extraordinary things to say about the story of this man. He's certainly a favourite uh, for me. He was born in 1832 in Barnsley in Yorkshire where he grew up. His conversion to Christ happened uh, in a way that's wonderful. It's a beautiful story. His mother prayed for him uh, earnestly when he was a teenager. On one occasion, prayed so earnestly because she was worried about him, got to the point during praying when she was away, was visiting a relative, where she knew in her soul, she just knew, God has heard my prayer. He's become a Christian. She just knew it. And she saw him a few days later. And, and while she, 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 he comes up to her and says, I've got some wonderful news for you, Mum. And she says, I know, you've become a Christian. How did you know? And he described the moment when he had taken a gospel tract, read it through when he was bored one afternoon, nothing to do, read it and came to faith in Christ, independently, it seemed. And he said what time it was, and they discovered it was the time when she came to this point of confidence in prayer. He's a Christian. It's phenomenal. So it's one of those inspiring stories in itself, encouraging for all mums, for sure. And, and at an early stage, knew that he was destined for China. He trained as a medic in order to find a, a, you know, a way, a trade, a, a way of uh, serving practically, a way to keep himself going financially, uh, and a way of serving in a, in a different context as a kind of background. Joined a missionary society that did exist at the time, but for various reasons came to a point in about 1865 where he felt he needed to start something new. It involved an enormous amount of courage and faith because he didn't have funding. Uh, for various reasons, he, he wouldn't have been able to raise the money that was needed to take a whole team of missionaries. He wanted to take two dozen with him uh, to, to China. And he had a crisis point where he was actually in this very town in uh, June 1865 where praying on the beach, he felt that God gave him faith and confidence to recruit 24 missionaries without any known funds, but just praying, trusting that God would look after two dozen missionaries as they sailed to China. And, uh, and lo and behold, God looked after this extraordinary movement that began from then, the China Inland Mission, as it was then called, OMF as it is called now, uh, Overseas Missionary Fellowship. They, they flourished to the point where at uh, Hudson Taylor's death in 1905 in Xinjiang in China, there were 800 uh, full-timers uh, on the team, and there were 100,000 Chinese believers, many of whom would have been reached through the work of the CIM. Uh, there are loads of lessons we could learn from this extraordinary life. Uh, but I want to particularly draw on something that's, that's sometimes referred to as his spiritual secret. His spiritual secret. Hudson Taylor uh, had a son and a, a daughter-in-law who wrote a book years and years after his death called Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. Another heading under which this went, this sort of theme of teaching was the, the exchanged life, the exchanged life. And I want to just draw out some things from it uh, to help us today. That's the goal. Let me talk about why, why this might be a secret. Because like I've been saying, this guy was remarkable, even though he was a man just like us. There were some things about his life that would suggest that we would be talking about a guy overwhelmed with responsibilities and pressures and strains and sorrows. He, he, he was certainly a high achiever. Ruth Tucker, who is a kind of historian of Christian mission, she says that no other missionary in the 19th centuries since the Apostle Paul has had a wider vision and has carried out a more systematized plan of evangelizing a broad geographical area than Hudson Taylor. And, and then you look at his responsibilities, serving, leading, pioneering, fathering, a church planting agency, effectively, a church planting team that grew into the hundreds without any conventional method of funding meant that he was carrying the financial responsibility 
of hundreds of people, hundreds of families even, with little children, sailing for months. There's a picture of one of the boats. The first boat, in fact, that he travelled to China on was one of these old clipper-type boats that would have gone to the Far East in those times. The first time he sailed, he nearly was shipwrecked just off the coast of Liverpool. And a few times as they went to the, the Far East, it was, it was nearly shipwrecked. Incredible dangers, incredible sufferings. Many people who had similar journeys and prospects to Hudson Taylor would have lost their lives traveling at this time. This was not the era of the long-haul flight. This was not the era of the layover at Dubai. This is not the era of upgrade to first class because you've got an honest face. This was the era of typhoid, malaria, all kinds of sinister bandits on the road and shipwrecks. It's the era of losing everything in an instant because of just the mishap of a storm. People who, who did not have the kind of comforts that we have, the kind of medics that we have, the kind of instant gratification that we have, the kind of communications that we have, the kind of emails and tweets that we live by as if, as if we're entitled to them. No, no, this is a different world, different challenges and troubles for sure. And he carried the responsibility through his life. He also carried the responsibility of seeing many of those he had recruited to his ranks being persecuted to the point of martyrdom in China. During the Boxer Rebellion of the very early 20th century, uh, there were 48 adults put to death, Western missionaries uh, put to death as uh, unwanted foreigners during the Boxer Rebellion in 21 children. And for a guy like Hudson Taylor to face the, the reality of that was overwhelming. He personally knew terrible sufferings. The, the descriptions of the, the loss of some of his children, especially one of them, Gracie, uh, written about in uh, uh, the late 1860s, is heartbreaking, absolutely devastating. His first wife, Maria, died in her late 30s. Uh, Maria and Hudson Taylor were an incredible team together. And you read the account of her death, and you won't read it without being moved, most of you, I'm sure, to tears. These, these people knew horrendous sufferings. He, at the point when the Boxer Rebellion was at its pitch, suffered what probably should be described as a breakdown, uh, went for a long season of rest in Switzerland to recover. Uh, he himself was certainly at certain points deeply conscious of his own shortcomings. He didn't have necessarily the most sanguine of personalities. He knew what it was to feel shame and guilt and disappointment with himself. It kind of dogged him for a large chunk of his life. And so you get the impression, don't you, that we're talking about A, a really impressive person, and B, a really miserable person. The truth is actually the opposite in both cases. On the face of it, people who got to meet him were often taken by how unimpressive he seemed. There's a, there's a story late on in his life where he's traveling, I think he was in Canada, with, another, with a friend called Henry Frost uh, on a train, and it was one of those sleepover trains, they were sharing a cabin, and Henry Frost uh, found in some Christian periodical an article of someone describing Hudson Taylor rather disdainfully, saying what a disappointing person he was, and thinking what he, comparing him to their image of the great missionary, the great you know, in those days, missionaries weren't like the, the evil people that we sort of see them as in our culture today. In those days, missionaries everywhere were heroes, even if you weren't a Christian. Missionaries were the goodies. These days, they're the baddies in the, in the popular culture. But in those days, it was like David Livingston, people who did amazing things. And they looked at Hudson Taylor, and they thought he must be an extraordinary guy. And this journalist had met him and said, eh, he's nothing like David Livingston. He's not, he's not an impressive person at all. He's got no command. He's got no presence. He's got no charisma. He's quite ordinary and described it in quite withering terms. Henry Frost saw the article and hid it under a load of other newspapers in the cabin. He said, I don't want Hudson to see that. That would be devastating. But to his own dismay, he saw later on, when he, at an unguarded moment, he just picked it out from the pile and read through and saw this article about himself. And he noticed him reading it on the bunk above him with interest. And at the end of it, he thought, oh, what's he going to say? It's going to deeply hurt him. And he, at the end of it, Hudson just smiled laughed and closed it, put it away, and said, what, what, are you not upset? And he says, no, no, I agree with every word. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I've always said. I'm not an impressive person. I've always said I'm a weak man. 
I'm a weak man. God delights to use weak people because it gives him great glory. And he lived that way. He believed it. Without any affectation, he wasn't acting the part. He wasn't false humility. He was aware, very aware of his weakness, very aware of the strength of his Savior. He, he actually was a man of genuine joy. One of the f- famous quotations of Hudson Taylor towards the end of his life, I never made a sacrifice. I never made a sacrifice. What did he mean by that? He said, I won. <laughs> I suffered for sure, but I tell you, in the end, it was all better than worth it. Because Jesus, Jesus to me is sweeter, is greater, is more fulfilling than all the things I might have had to let go of in pursuing him. He was a great Christian hedonist, to use John Piper's phrase. In fact, the life of Hudson Taylor seems, at least as he progresses to maturity, to be characterized by a steady peace and joy, which enabled a focus in prayer and in faith. So when I showed you that picture of that boat and those stories are true, you've got to bear in mind, he would have, he would have prayed the shipwrecks away several times, <laughs> prayed the storms away on the boat. He, he knew what it was to pray very, very remarkably, had incredible power in prayer. On, on, at one point, in about 1887, the, the, the inland mission were recruiting and they wanted to get their first hundred, their first hundred recruits to start mission stations across all the provinces of China. And they actually got to the point, Hudson Taylor said, just like his mother said, I felt that I'd already got the answer in prayer. He prayed and he felt, I knew in my soul we've got a hundred. By the end of the year, we will have a hundred missionaries. I know it. And he, he kind of described it to me. He said, we've got a hundred. He started planning as if they were coming. And one senior uh, veteran mission guy came to Hudson Taylor and said, well, obviously you won't get 100 by the end of the year, but well done for going for it, because you'll get more by going for it than if you hadn't. So you won't get them, but well done. He's kind of trying to calm him down. And Hudson Taylor said, thanks for your advice. Um, I I don't think I will get them either. I have got them. (laughs) And you, my friend, by the end of the year will rejoice with me when you see the 100th come in. It's pretty bold words, but it came true. Literally came true. It was a phenomenal, audacious goal. To go for 100 was utterly unexpected. No one expected that to work. But in faith, they pursued things. He lived this way. He kind of confident in the power of God to answer prayer. It's a nice story once when he's traveling with a <coughs> guy called Mr. Beauchamp, who, who uh, is noticing the way that Hudson Taylor is saying grace before they've got any food. They're traveling from one town to another in China. And uh, there's no, they haven't got any food. There's nowhere to buy any food. And Hudson Taylor starts saying grace. And he says, what are you saying grace for? We haven't got any food. Hudson Taylor says, well, the food's coming. I know it is. He always looks after me. He'll give me some food. I'm saying grace so that when the food arrives, I don't have to waste any time. You'll have to say grace when it comes. So I'll get to eat before you. And sure enough, within a few minutes, they stop at this place where there's, you know, unexpectedly someone selling some rice and they're able to eat. He kind of had this kind of abiding confidence in God's faithfulness through his life. Even at the darkest times, when the Boxer Rebellion was claiming the lives of whole families, uh, some, a colleague called George Nichol, leaving the room that Hudson Taylor was in, the study he was in, when he got the news, he opened one of the letters and got the message. He was leaving the room to give space. So he, he'll need some space. He'll probably break down and cry. I'll just let him be on his own. He got to the door, and he, all he heard was whistling. And Hudson Taylor was whistling, whistling a hymn that we don't sing these days, but the words are good. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of who you are or who thou art. And uh, he turns to him, how can you whistle at a time like this? And, and Hudson said, I, I can only rejoice. I can only be joyful. I, well, I don't think the word, I'm going to quote him wrongly. He says, I have to lay the burden on him. I'm no good to anyone if I don't seek peace and joy in my own heart. He wasn't being unreal. He wasn't in denial. He went through terrible suffering and knew the heartbreak of it. But he also taught himself to trust, rest in the faithfulness of the one who is in control of everything. Everything. And these are superb lessons for us. Even just as one other example, in the context of possible revenge, 
after the Boxer Rebellion, the, the British government wanted to exact vengeance on the Chinese government. And when it was quelled, they wanted to have recompense, as if you can, for the lives of these families. And, and the CIM publicly stated their opposition to that policy. We will not take revenge. We will not seek reparations. We would rather win the Chinese to Christ, who forgives and loves. That's an amazing approach, but I think it's consistent with his kind of confident, childlike trust in the God who provides and meets needs. So uh, he, he was able to live in a place of peace and joy, but I want us to look just before we finish at where this came from. What's the root of it? He would probably say, if, if you were to ask him, how did you get to this place? And it was, a, it was something that he grew in as he, as he matured. As he got older, he became more settled, more at peace. But he would particularly say something that happened in 1869. At that point, he got to a time of real crisis uh, for outward and inward reasons. Uh, the, the mission itself had suffered persecution, being thrown out of various towns by volatile crowds, some violence, some genuine threat to life. And it was a time of real suffering. At the same time, the British government, having got wind of the, um, the kind of uh, disharmony, you know, the, 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 the trouble, instead of coming down in support of the CIA, came down against them and said, well, you're stirring up trouble in China. Stop it. And, and they got kind of told off by the, by the people who spoke against them in Parliament. So it was a bitter time for, for Hudson Taylor and the, and the China Inland Mission. And then inwardly, as well as the loss of his daughter, Gracie, who I described earlier, he, he was aware of his own failings to an acute level. He was deeply discouraged by how unchristlike he felt himself to be, how often he fell short, how his levels of faith seemed to be limited and shallow and he was just increasingly unimpressed with himself inwardly. And if I, if I, you tend to think, don't you, if you've done anything like what this guy's done by that time in his life, the time for self-examination, let alone self-hatred, is over. Because I've done it. I've, I've achieved. I'm a good guy. I must be good enough now. Maybe that's how we naturally think, right? If, if only I could be like Hudson Taylor, I'd be good enough. Well, here is Hudson Taylor saying, I'm not good enough. That should be a warning, right? Where are you putting your confidence? If you think, well, I, if, only, if I try a little harder, if I, if I aim a little further, if I succeed a little more, if I become a bit more productive as a Christian, that will be enough. That will be good enough. That will be righteous enough. Righteous enough for God. Righteous enough for me and my high standards. I tell you, learn, learn from these heroes God gives us. That is never true. It's never true. Even the man himself was deeply disappointed with himself. And he got to a point of real low, real discouragement. And at that time, 1869, a letter arrived in the summer from a friend, John McCarthy, who, who had come, uh, who had been meditating on some scripture particularly and been helped by some good teaching uh, mostly good teaching, which, which described a different approach. And the way that Hudson Taylor, like I said, tended to describe it himself was this language of the exchange life. But if I was to try and carve it up into three things before I finish, I would put it down to these following three. The first of all would be the insufficiency of our faith. See, one of the problems that Hudson had struggled with was the weakness of his own faith. The sense that his problems would be reduced if only he could exercise adequate faith. He, he loved faith. He was a man of faith. And perhaps being so successful in you know, raising money by faith, praying against shipwreck and storm by faith, and achieving things by faith, he'd come to be enamored of the importance of faith, but came to see the weakness of his faith. And struggled with it. I thought, my faith is still so weak. My faith is so feeble. My faith is so poor. And really, in the end, if you go down that route, you are going to get discouraged. It's going to hurt you 
Because faith in itself, our faith, is not really the, the, the focus. It's not sufficient. Our faith in itself is, is going to be, at best, patchy. At best, weak. We've got to come to terms with the faithfulness instead of Jesus. The faithfulness of Jesus. And come to a, a confidence in his sufficiency. He as the faithful one. He as the object of faith. Not our faith being the object of faith. I don't put my faith in my faith. I don't even want to be that conscious of my faith. My faith is not the main thing. Jesus, in whom I put my faith, is the main thing. And I need to look to him, remember him, see the greatness of him, see the lovingness and the willingness of him. See his love towards me. See his faithfulness towards me. His utter commitment to me. And that will help me to grow in confidence. And focusing back on the faithfulness of Christ was a huge, huge lesson for him. The second thing, which was linked with that, was just a fresher grasp of what it meant to be joined with Jesus, united with Jesus. Union with Jesus. One of the glorious, big themes of the Bible. And what Jesus came to give us was not just a way out of trouble, a way out of punishment, a way out of guilt, a way out of sin. Uh, not even to give us uh, a, a future in heaven with God. A future knowing God and having a relationship with God. These are buzzwords and phrases that we're very used to. But Jesus came to offer us much more. Jesus came to offer us nothing less than himself. He didn't say, come, come to me and you will be, I'm a tree and you will be like a tree just like me if you're really you know, faithful and really good. You, you'll be a bit like me. You, you'd, be a, you'd be a tree a bit like me, not as good, but a bit like me if, you, if you're faithful. And he said, if you... Trust me. Put your faith in me. I, I'm the vine. You're the branches. You're, you're joined with me already. Your, your faithfulness isn't the point. I'm the faithful tree. I am the faithful. I'm the true vine. I'm the faithful, trustworthy servant of God. And I'm saying to you, come and be joined with me. Be one with me. And let all of your fruitfulness come out of your union with me. And this is a massive, wonderful theme. You see, the, the, the way Jesus described it was in similar terms to his union with the Father and his union with the Holy Spirit. When we talk about God the Trinity, we're talking about mysteries, but the, the, we're meant to understand some of it. We're not meant to just say, well, that's mysterious. I'll put that in the mystery bin and not ever try to understand it. No, 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 don't, you don't need to. Jesus invites us to press in and understand it more. To know that he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. The, the level of union between the Father and the Son is so much so, it's not like a zero-sum game. It's not, well, you've got Father, so you can't have Christ. You've got Christ, so you can't have Father. No, they're so joined. They're so fused. They're, jo they're, they're one together. And Jesus offers us the same union with himself. He prays to the Father, let them be one with me as I am with you and you are with me. What's on offer to, to, to the sinner, to the weakling, to the failure, is nothing less than true union with Christ. Union through Christ with the Father. Being joined as one. Being, being brought into fresh identity. This is massive for us. And it, it, the more we understand it, the more we allow the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the glory of it, the more secure and stable we are because of it. For some of you, this might be new. The, even the idea that Christianity is not actually about striving to be a good enough tree or a good enough this or a good enough that, but to understand that there is one who has proved good enough, utterly proved, tested, tested even to death on the cross, Put through every trial, every strain, meeting every test and prevailing in faithfulness, completely faithful. And we, by grace, are joined with him, joined with him. And so ours is not to try and emulate him. 
Ultimately, ours is to lean into him. With all our weakness and failure, to lean on him. Lean on him. And seeing ourselves as failures, seeing ourselves as weak is part of the pattern, part of the process. It's a necessary part of the process. If you never get to those points of seeing your failing, seeing your weakness, you'll struggle to lean because you'll try and stand instead. And that kind of standing is nothing in a storm. You've got to learn, like Hudson did, to lean. Lean on the one to whom we've been joined by grace. This is what being a Christian is. Your faith ultimately isn't the thing that saves you. Otherwise, we would always be puzzled about whether our faith is good enough. Is my faith adequate? Is my faith sufficient? No, my Savior is sufficient. His faithfulness. Some people take Paul's words in Galatians 2.20 and try and and translate it literally where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ And it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live, and the literal translation is, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, there is argument about which is the most appropriate translation. Some would say, no, it must be faith in the Son of God. Hudson himself took the literal one and loved it because it lent Credibility to this point he got to, where he felt he needed to see this is about his faithfulness, his complete capacity to look after me steadily, to be the faithful one where I am faithless. He remains faithful because he cannot deny himself, as Paul says to Timothy in one of the later letters. This is one of the ways he describes it himself in in, uh, one of his writings. He says, As I read, I saw it all. I looked to Jesus and saw... And when I saw, oh, how joy flowed, that he had said, I will never leave thee. I saw not only that Jesus will never leave me, but that I am a member of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. The vine is not the root merely, but all root, stem, branches, twigs, leaves, flowers and fruit. And Jesus is not that alone. He is soil and sunshine, air and showers, and 10,000 times more than we have ever dreamed, wished for, or needed. Oh, the joy of seeing this truth. He came to an awareness of his joinedness with Christ and the givenness of Christ to him. See, this is a, a very important thing for us, that we understand that Jesus has been given to us. I think the way we talk sometimes, we perhaps understand Jesus as having almost been given as a loan. He was loaned to us. He came and lived 30 years, 33 years. He died on the cross for our sins. He was buried. He rose. And he went back. It was good to have him while he was here. We get the benefits. Thanks for dying for us. Thanks for paying the price. Thank you for what you did for us. Thank you for the job you did. I hope you're enjoying whatever you're doing now. But, but thanks for the bit you did for us. That was nice to have that little segment of your eternal career donated to our need. That isn't Christianity. Jesus has been given you forever. Given you forever. He's, he's to be married to you forever and ever. It's where marriage vows come from. Till death do us part. He's never going to die. <laughs> and he said, if you believe in me, neither will you. You're joined with him. He's given you forever. He now, the Bible says, ever lives to do what? To make intercession for you. To pray for you with perfect faith. Perfect faith. My prayers are often really feeble. I don't know about yours. Well, I do know about yours. I know enough to know that they're probably not always brilliant. My faith levels are weak. I would be in despair if I wasn't able to rest on the perfect prayer, the perfect interceder, the perfect priest, always praying, always given for me, always joined with me. This was, this was Hudson's secret. He lived in it. I, I encourage you to live in it. Now, let me just say as a final thing, we're out of time, so I'll make this as a final comment. This is not actually, for some of you, news. You'd be thinking, well, I've heard you preach this before. I've read those verses before. I know this. 
Hudson Taylor knew it too. He learned it before 1869. He knew his Bible better than I do, much better. He knew the Bible. He knew the teaching. But there is such a thing as knowing with fire, knowing what you know by the grace of God. This is what Paul says to the Ephesians. My prayer is that you will have strength, power to know that which cannot be known. Strength to know. You know that the, the, the verses I'm talking about, Ephesians chapter 3, to know that love that surpasses knowledge, to know the height, the depth, the length, the breadth of it. It's something that we know for sure by studying. We need to study. We need to give time. Don't think, well, I need Hudson Taylor's secret, therefore I will just sort of wait in my room for it all to dawn on me. No, no, no. The guy was diligent. He got to know God through the Scripture. But in that place, the, 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 the Spirit of God comes upon the knowledge of the truth to bring life and joy. And if your if you're union with Christ... Is, is just academic. It's just, well, I know that bit of theology. Yes, I do get that. I'm united with Christ. Thank you. You're missing it, my friend. And you're missing something that is precious and is actually the secret to fruitful service of God. To live in the good of it, to know it, is actually to wait on the Lord. Wait on him. Lord, I don't want to just know this academically. I want the Holy Spirit to bring power to know it. Power. Give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation that I might know this. And this is what he talks of. There was a time when the spirit came and gave him this. And that's what we need, all of us. Let me pray, I hope, I want to pray that we all continue to live in the good of that, but also have times when the spirit of God brings it to us in a specially urgent kind of way. Let's pray right now and uh, perhaps prepare ourselves for communion. I'd like the musicians to come and join me as I just lead in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your extraordinary salvation. Lord, this is kindness that we can't really grasp. And I feel like, Lord, I kind of speak in mysteries that we can, we can sort of allow them to wash over us and not seize the good from them. And I pray that you would help us to receive the good of our union with your Son, that these three things, your faithfulness, our union with you, and the power of the Spirit to bring revelation rather than just information, these things will be our experience as well, each one of us, each one of us. Teach us to be diligent at waiting on you. Teach us to learn to lean heavily on you in our own weakness. And Lord, help us to bear fruit for you. Lord, thank you for a life that was so fruitful in this man. God, we want to be a fruitful people. We want to be a church that has tremendous fruit to look at in years to come, even in this city. So Lord, teach us to lean on you for that result. In Jesus' name, amen.